Hi there. Hello. It's Carrie. Um, today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Um, I was planning on filming my first ever reading vlog. I was going to take you to a cute cafe. We were going to spend the whole day reading and I finished the book before I could do that. Um, I just kind of like laid in bed one night and I finished it. So the reading vlog would have literally just been me in my bed for however many hours. So here's what's gonna happen in this video. I'm going to tell you about the book, do a little review, um, but I'm also going to be doing something that the book inspired me to do. And you're gonna come along for the ride because it is gonna be a ride. We are going to be cooking something, baking something. Um, and I do not have all of the tools or the ingredients that I need. So, um, full disclaimer, this is a book channel, not a baking channel. You've been forewarned, but I hope it'll be fun. So let's dive into it. The book that we are talking about is <clears throat> Whoa. Woven in the Moonlight by Isabel Ibanez. And it is actually based off of or inspired by Bolivian culture, history, politics, a lot of things are intertwined in here. And this, I believe, is her debut novel, and it does have a sequel that should be out now, actually. I'm also going to start chopping these walnuts right now, which I will explain why in a second. I'm working against the clock here, so let's go. This is a young adult fantasy that takes place in somewhere called Inca Sisa. And to set the scene, we learn that there was recently a pretty violent revolution between the two people that live there, the Illustrians and the Yakasans, I believe it's how it's pronounced. All we know is that the Illustrians lost the throne and now there is a king who is ruling in a very dictator-like way. He's using this kind of magical device called La Estrella to keep his control. So the Illustrians are searching for that, the ones who have survived, who are now in hiding, so that they can take back their throne. That's what we learn. But our story actually starts with two girls, Jimena and Catalina. Catalina is actually La Condesa, so she is the heir to the illustrian throne. So they're hoping to place her back as queen. But Jimena is actually her decoy, kind of like in Star Wars, you know? And they have been switching places since they were eight years old. Um, she is simply there as like a stand-in, a bodyguard, kind of in case anybody tries to kill her. So when King Alok sends messengers to say that he wants the Condesa to come to his palace and marry him, Jimena goes instead in order to protect Catalina and hopefully to destroy the court from the inside. But once she gets there, of course, she starts to meet people and see things in a way that she hadn't ever really seen it. And so she really has to think about like what it is to be a ruler and who should rule and how should they rule and stuff like that. I thought it was really fun. There's also a masked vigilante who kind of doesn't fall on either side of this argument. Um, and you know I love me a good mystery. So also Jimena is trying to solve the mystery of who the hell is El Lobo. And I love that. So I really enjoyed this book. I would give it like a 3.8 out of five if I can. I like the story. I just really wish she had gone deeper into the magic side of it. A lot of people in the story have powers, but they're all based on the moon, which I think is so cool. Like the reason this book is called Woven in the Moonlight is because Jimena has this weird power that she can turn moonlight into string and make a tapestry out of moonlight. It's just, it sounds really cool. And I wish that she had kind of gone into that more. Jimena didn't really use her power all that much. I also think about three quarters of the way through, it got a little boring slash predictable, but I'll let that slide because the stuff that I wanted to happen at the end happened. Um, so I really can't complain and I'm excited for the sequel. But I thought a lot of the messages within the story were really cool because as I said, Isabella Banez was really inspired by South American politics, like specifically Bolivia, but she did say kind of the rest of the continent. There is a kind of rich history of dictators and revolutions um, happening there. She kind of wanted this to be her commentary on that. What happens when, even if a ruler does try and rule for the right reasons, what happens if they change along the way um, and they kind of are no longer the person who they were when they started in power, stuff like that. I thought the themes were really cool. I, I like seeing people 
learn and change their opinions and I thought that this was done in a really good way and I thought the romance was quite cute too so <laughs> but now to get into why I am chopping all of these walnuts um this book let me tell you actually let me pull up the glossary there's more than a full page devoted to explaining the foods that she mentioned when I tell you I was salivating reading this book I am not exaggerating she talks about food so much and she had an interview where she mentioned the fact that she talks about food so much. One thing that she talks about a lot are these salpenas. She explains them as baked football shaped empanadas from Bolivia, filled with beef or pork or chicken, raisins, peas, and exactly one black olive and boiled egg. It sounds so good. They talk about these all the time in the book and I was literally like, can I have one please? So I was inspired. I wanted to make something um, that she talked about. And so I decided to make actually one of the first foods that she ever introduced, and it is torta de nuez or torta de nueces walnut cake. So this is in chapter one, and she's talking about kind of memories of before the revolution. Birthday fiestas are a thing of the past, existing only in my memory, but sometimes I can still taste my abuela's torta de nuez, a rich walnut cake smothered in creamed coffee and dulce de leche. So that's what we're going to make. I had a lot of fun learning about it. Um, there are so many different ways to make it. As with any popular traditional recipe, I think every family has a different way of doing it. But I found my recipe from a blog called Sabores de Bolivia. I wanted to make sure I was making a kind of Bolivian take on this and it is the Torta de Nueces de Rosa Elena. So apparently the woman who runs this vlog um, knows a woman named Rosa Elena who is like a legend in the kitchen. I don't have all of the ingredients though. She uses a lot of alcohol. Also, if you're new to this channel, I live in Korea and a little bit rare to have a proper oven in your house. So I actually bake using my rice cooker. I say this all the time whenever I'm baking with my rice cooker, but it could be a disaster, but it's all about the journey, right? We're gonna learn things along the way. I have got dulce de leche making on my counter right now. I have never made it before. When I learned that you're just supposed to boil a, a literal can, I got very scared, but I looked it up on YouTube and I saw a lot of people doing it, even white people were doing it and they weren't failing. So um, I've got a can boiling and it terrifies me and I'm checking on it every five seconds. Here we go, let's go make it. Ba -ba -ba -ba. We are ready. Um, oh my goodness. We're gonna crack 10 eggs. Are you kidding me? No, I am not. We're going to separate the yolks and the whites. Uno. Dos. Yes, I did take Spanish. Okay, <laughs> if anyone's asking. I studied Spanish for five years. I think, yeah, I, I was kind of traumatized by, oh, no, 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 broke that yolk. Um, I was kind of traumatized by my first Spanish teacher. Um, we were forced to sing a lot in Spanish, like in front of the class, which as a teenager was just hell on earth. Speaking was so scary to me. Um, so I don't actually like to speak. I wish that I did, but um, I can understand it quite well. It was surprisingly for the amount that I hated to speak it, it was actually, my best subject. It was like the highest score on the AP test that I ever got. Um, so yeah, there, there's that. I love Spanish. I think it's such a beautiful language. It was the first language I learned as like as a second language. I'm from San Diego, so I live about 30 minutes from the Mexican border. So I'm more familiar with Mexican culture and I love it. I was really excited to learn more about South American culture, because I feel like I really only know like the Incas. So this book was just really fun. I, I enjoyed it a lot. We don't often see a lot of South American representation in fantasy. The only like Mexican fairy tale that I ever learned uh, was Popocatepetl and Itzdaxiwatl. I remember having to like read that in class and every time I had to say Itzdaxiwatl, that that like wattle sound in Spanish. So why is it so difficult for me to say? It, it's like Mexico's Romeo and Juliet kind of, except they're volcanoes. Did I pass the class? Yes. Um, okay, anyway, 
I'm gonna set aside the egg whites and we're going to whip up some yolks. Sugar, one cup. Add the ground Maria cookies. Okay, we gotta talk about the Maria cookies, hold on. So these, Maria Galletas, um, I asked you guys about where to find them. Let me get a baggie, hold on. So I asked you guys on Instagram where I could find these in Korea and I got so many funny answers saying like, oh my God, I didn't know those existed outside of Portugal. Oh my God, I didn't know those existed outside of Spain or like Mexico or all this stuff. And I just found it so funny um, that all you guys didn't know that these cookies are international, they are global. But anyway, I got these on Coupang. If any of you guys are living in Korea, you find yourself needing Maria cookies. They're basically just like tea cookies. They kind of remind me of animal crackers. <sighs> she is done. Two cups of these cookies. One, two. Mm. Add in the whipped egg whites and the rest of the ingredients. I mean, do, does she really mean like whipped somewhere? Rosa Elena is probably like getting a sudden headache or something. Someone is butchering my recipe somewhere in this world. Hi again. So I, <laughs> oh, my arm is shaking. Um, So I don't have an electric mixer here. And so I was doing this by hand. I kid you not, I've been doing it for 20 minutes and it is not the correct consistency. I know, but I got a lot of air in there. It's a little bit whipped. Um, I just can't, I can't do it anymore. Rosa Elena, I'm so sorry, but this is as whipped as the egg whites are gonna get. You're supposed to be able to literally flip this over and it stays because it's like whipped. Um, but there's definitely still a lot of egg white liquid in there. So please don't judge me too hard for that. And the other ingredients. Oh, I need to go get my lemon, my coffee, my vodka and cognac. <laughs> and I have my baking soda here. Okay, be right back. Ah, my coffee. Oh my God, my cheese grater. Ah! If I am missing an ingredient, we're just not gonna put it in. I'm not getting back up. Instead of Nescafe, we're putting a Korean spin on it. We're using Idia coffee, their original Americano. Don't say that that shit's talking to me. Speak up. Coffee. In. Grated lemon from Chile. Mix you in there. This smells amazing. Okay, now is when we have our cup of vodka. And I have heard rumors on the internet that you can just use water and lime. I can't imagine it will taste bad. Adding lime to literally anything is a good idea. Our pitcher of vodka, aka water. Slanta, salud. More internet rumors. Cognac. Pear juice. This seems really sweet, so I'm only gonna do three quarters instead of a cup. Cause it's sweet, yeah, all right. The recipe just calls for Royale. And I was like, what is that? Another alcohol, Rosa Elena? But no, it's a brand of baking powder or baking soda. In Korea, baking powder and baking soda are the same. So there's that. The final mix. Let's transfer this to my rice cooker. <laughs> Here she is. I do not think this is all going to fit. Oh, it will. Oh, it smells so good, you guys. Oh my God. Put it in and I'm gonna choose menu. Cake. All right, that click means she's doing something. See you soon. Okay, I'm very nervous about this. Come on. Ooh, ooh. Oh my God. <laughs> I think it could have gone for a little bit longer. 
I put it in for about two and a half, but maybe I didn't have, it was supposed to be boiling, but it wasn't like, oh, wait a sec, no, this looks good. Yeah, it could have been in there for a little bit longer. Oh, that's beautiful. That's delicious. The cake is ready, I'll be right back. Hello there, so um, literally, Halfway through this was baking, I realized that I forgot to put any oil or anything at the bottom, so this might have stuck. Also, for some reason, it gave me an error code and wouldn't let me open it, so I had to put it on for another, like, an extra five minutes so it would open. But let- Oh! That's why. Oh my god. It got so- <laughs> First off, it smells great, but it got so big that it actually stuck to the top of this rice cooker. So hold on, I might have to do this standing up. Well, at least it didn't stick. <laughs> I've never seen that happen before. Oh my God, give me back my cake. That was interesting. It stuck to the top. <laughs> okay, so I'm not gonna lie to you guys. It looks really ugly and I'm scared to cut into it because it does not seem done but here is my walnut cake i covered it with a bit of the dulce de leche you're usually supposed to cut it in half and then use the um dulce de leche as a layer in the middle but i'm like i said scared to cut this do you see how jiggly it is um scared to cut this so i just put it on top and then i used some of the extra walnuts i had it's actually it kind of looks cute this way but um I'm telling you, when I cut this open, it's probably not gonna be done. And there's really not a whole lot I can do about that. Unfortunately, when you're baking with a rice cooker, it kind of looks like more like a bread pudding, unfortunately. Um, but it's still, that means that it's still edible. So I'm going to try it, especially from the bottom where it looks more done. Here it is, let's see. That's really good though. You can still taste the lemon. That's really good actually. Oh my gosh. Put a bit more of that. Do we share the leche? Please. Let's see. Oh. Yeah. Okay. The dulce de leche takes it to like another level. Wow. My walnut cake. Yay. So I'm going to kind of wrap it up here, but I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who responded on Instagram when I asked you about this cake and I got so many really cool answers. A lot of people said that they added cinnamon or um, somebody said that they actually would add apple and make it kind of like an apple pie slash walnut cake. I think it was from Brazil. They um, Somebody said that they made like a kind of meringue using coconut milk whipping it up which sounded really good. Um, there were just so many different variations to this dish that was really cool. Um, even someone from Poland said that they had something similar. Um, and so yeah, I just, that was really cool. It was a cool learning experience um, to talk to you guys about it and to make this. Yeah, wow, Torta de Nueces. Rosa Elena, I'm so sorry for letting you down. This is not, I'm sure yours is great. I'm sure yours is like not even comparable to this one, but I had a lot of fun and I thank you for your recipe. Thank you to Sogores de Bolivia, the blog. This recipe will be linked down below. I'll also like add in um, the differences that I made. And yeah, wow, yum. Okay, thank you um, Isabel Ibanez for inspiring this with your lovely book Woven in the Moonlight. Um, definitely check it out. It's It was a fun, quick read. It was definitely like younger, young adult, but it was still really nice. Um, to read and just don't read it when you're hungry is all I can say. So, all right, I'm going to go clean up, eat more of this. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining me. Okay. Bye. <laughs>